most weekends, sometimes during weeknights, but let's call that from 11 to, I don't know, 16 or so, was either at the springs or on the springs and just trying to absorb as much as I could. Off Gassing, a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogle. At an early age, Grant Tobin was adopted into the Florida cave diving community. Learning the ways of the cave early on shaped him into the diver he is today. An active member of the Midwest Underwater Explorers, a volunteer of the Wisconsin Historical Society's Maritime Preservation and Archaeology Program, and he continues to find his way back to the Sunshine State to enjoy the overhead environment. In this episode, I speak with Grant about why he switched from the KISS Sidewinder to the Fathom Gemini, side mount versus back mount rebreathers, advice for divers seeking overhead training, and much more. Please enjoy. Grant, how are you doing this evening? Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Doing all right, kind of on my end. What about your half of the world? I am just waking up and... Uh, unfortunately, I lost the the filter to my coffee maker the a while back, so I had to order a new one. So I'm drinking tea, which is probably a little bit better way to start the morning, um, rather than a cup of coffee that I would prefer. But you know, got to get that caffeine one way or another. <laughs> so <laughs> everybody's got their vices. But no, I really uh, appreciate you coming on to the podcast today. My first question is, tell me about how and why you got into scuba diving. Tell me about that first breath, that first experience, what led into you wanting to become a scuba diver. And then I guess if you just want to give like a little bit of uh, background of, of who you are. Sure. I'll start with the diving bit, I think, first. Family moved from upstate New York to Daytona Beach when I was about 10 years old. And halfway between my middle school and my folks place was dive shop and being young and exuberant and really into water sports, begged and pleaded. And somehow my father found a way to get my brother, him, a cousin, and I all into a dive class and it kind of started a certainly a youthful obsession I think most people look back at their open water class and it's kind of the same day in the classroom, day in the pool, a couple days diving. One of the perks, at least in Daytona, is a lot of the springs are within a 45 minute drive. And then if you want to head south, anything from two hours to four hours south, you have certainly some of the better reefs in Florida. And I think what made it go from a, hey, this is cool, to, hey, I do this a lot was simply that the dive shop had a very active group of instructors who operated in a lot of ways like a family. And in being, I don't know, young, I almost ended up being adopted by really the owner at the time, who was a 30-year master chief, and then the manager of the shop who taught my open water class and also went on to teach a lot of my open circuit technical training. And starting from that year, which I would say was 2005 or thereabouts, uh, pretty much every opportunity, whether it was on the way home from school, I begged my mother to go drop me off the dive shop, started hanging out, would trade a seat in the instructor's vehicle in exchange for getting to hang out and go dive in the state parks with them for the day, um, and built up a lot of time in the water which I was really thankful for I'm sure I was a huge burden on them uh, retrospectively who wants the liability of an 11 year old kid and a 12 year old kid and <laughs> eventually turning into a young teenager just sitting in the back of their truck I uh, couldn't shut up about everything diving and ended up becoming a sponge a couple of those individuals uh, I still remain really close friends with everybody from the manager to people that would have I don't know bridged the age gap say they were college students or in that area at the time and one of the things about the shop is that nearly every one of those instructors was active in the cave diving scene, one way or the other. Managers sat on the NACD board of directors, and I think all but one or two uh, were cave diving at least once a month. 
so a pair of the gentlemen started inviting me, and they were in the habit of driving up to Tooney Springs, kind of after work one night, and that was about three hours away, doing a bunch of dives, and then driving back at, oh, dark 30 in the morning, and I realized that, hey, all these people that I think are cool are cave diving, I don't know anything about it, and there's no way in hell my parents would ever allow such a ridiculous <laughs> concept, and uh, next thing you know, they all had power of attorney on me. <laughs> It's a little horrifying, and we'd kind of, you know, they'd finish their dive, or we'd work out a, hey, you know, we'll go dive, you pick up dinner, meet you in the Ginny Springs Basin, and you'll go run cavern lines and tie-offs until you can't feel your hands, <laughs> and rinse and repeat. Uh, so it was really to the point where by, I don't know, 14, at least to uh, their standard, things are going all right. And really, I was fortunate to be surrounded by people whose behavior I wanted to adopt. If you asked me to go, and I realize now that I'm about their age, when I was hanging around with them, to go hang out, even in Jenny Springs Ballroom, which is largely considered a safe cavern, if that's not an oxymoron, and help them run line drills and primary tie-offs for two hours after you've just been getting out of a long cave dive. Uh, I don't know what I'd say. I think I would appreciate the opportunity to do so. Uh, but man, I uh, put them in some situations. So uh, around my 15th birthday, or as a 15th birthday present, the certification age for Cavern happened to be 15, whether that was via the NACD at the time or the up-and-coming SSI Tech XR program. Ended up getting Cavern certification, uh, my present on my 16th birthday was a uh, letter, a press release from Larry Green saying, hey, uh, we moved the intro to cave age to 16. I okay. can go take your class. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, I lucked out quite a bit in that one. Certainly worth a laugh in retrospect. So most weekends, sometimes during weeknights, but let's call that from 11 to, I don't know, 16 or so was either at the springs or on the springs and just trying to absorb as much as I could. Then first couple summers university, same thing. Uh, I would have, whether it was summers or winter breaks and such, in Florida and again focused on diving. I found a lot of those things would come and go as I got into the later years of university. It was, oh, maybe I dive 10 days a year, 12 days a year. Still primarily overhead focused. I would enjoy whether it was friends that were similar in age or whatever else and heading to some of the open water sites or wreck sites. But the caves, or at least the people that I was cave diving with, seemed to draw a lot of that attention. The last couple of years of university into, say, the first couple of years in the real world in Chicago it was a continuation of that. Ah, I'll dive two weeks a year. It's not a huge priority certainly didn't acknowledge there was a lot of local diving to be done. One of the people that had taken me under his wing called me in 2017 said, hey, do you know what Bikini Atoll is? I'm like, oh, I like bikinis. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't. And uh, just started doing some, some research, and we ended up getting, I think we filled four or five people on the boat for a trip in 2019. And that was a realization that all right, as much as I think that I can retain competence no matter what, I definitely got to spend a lot more time in the water over the next couple of years. Bring us to maybe the end of 2017, down in Florida for a week around Christmas, diving to any springs, end up gearing up next to a woman, and she says, oh, I couldn't help but overhear you from the Midwest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, do you dive up there? I'm like, no. <laughs> be on a plane, three hours sitting in Florida, whether it's driving from Orlando or flying into Gainesville and in the water. I don't need dry gloves. You know, it's really making excuses. And she's like, ah, oh, come up to Wisconsin. I promise you'll like something. And ended up getting adopted into that community of divers, most of whom are either cave trained or there's a large group of individuals diving rebreathers that she kind of acts as the headquarters for. Next thing you know, having... I don't know, let's say disappeared from caring about 
rebreather development or science in diving developments for four or five years. Uh, I think I was ready to re broach the topic, but I was also in a financial situation in which I could do so. So ended up on uh, a few different rebreathers. I test dived them prior, but uh, again, with that gap, things changed a bit and kind of reinvigorated certainly a local interest. It went from becoming a, hey, I go down, cave diving was a means to hang out with my friends and relax during vacation, to, hey, back to doing this, you know, a few weekends a month. So that started, the impetus certainly was the bikini trip, but in reaffiliating myself with different people, different parts of the world, reestablishing old friends, contacts on the internet, it became a much bigger part of my life again. Brings us past the bikini trip, a couple other dive trips in between to COVID. COVID in that part of 2020, things in Chicago, where I'm based out of, were, I don't want to say hysterics, but certainly early on, I don't think anybody really acknowledged the changes that were happening or could be happening. And from a employment perspective, we were pretty fortunate to kick everybody out, said, here's a computer, go try working from home for a week just in case this lasts a little longer. And a month later, I said, eh, this is miserable. It's winter in the Midwest. Florida doesn't really have a COVID thing, but at very least the population density in North Florida seems a lot safer than what it is here. Turns out you can't have COVID if you don't measure it, so Florida was exceptionally safe at the time. <laughs> and, you know, I walked into a grocery store early April 2020 in High Springs, and everybody looked at me like oh, I was chicken with a head cut off, because why would you need a mask? So I ended up living down there for a few months that year, and again, was fortunate to meet up with few different people that were kind of doing the same thing, working from home or having moved to Florida for a bit. I actually ended up living at the dive outpost. I was the first customer in months. Um, it's really a dark period in a lot of the dive business, and every country handled it a little differently. But in doing so, met up with people from different backgrounds. Uh, I think a good group of them were the people, let's say, plus and minus 10 years my age, that were doing a lot of cave diving in Florida at the time. Everything from people that were just trying to dive every day to people that were trying to find something to explore to people, let's say, Adam Hughes, who were trying to make these awesome maps and doing a great job at it. And that started kind of a winters in Florida thing. So I'm down there, I don't know, four to six weeks a year, as soon as it gets probably holiday time in Chicago. Locally, I'm fortunate to participate. And, well, I wasn't a founder. I'm very active in the local Midwest under Explorer, Underwater Explorers group. And the same woman that reintroduced me to local diving happens to be the going to mess this up she'll kill me the wisconsin historical society chief of underwater archaeology so it does a lot in terms of having local shipwrecks named into the national register of historic places and has really just been a strong community to be around so in that i'd say the past call it five years have been as active as i was begging and pleading to have a seat in a truck to go hop in a single tank with an aluminum 80 with an open water class and just sit there try and figure out what hovering was but it's been good everything from conversations then to what you have on dive boats or mentoring has been very fulfilling and certainly a different group than i would say be affiliated with in any of my other pursuits no that's that's an amazing story i mean uh that I, I love the fact, I mean, you're like a, a true child of the cave. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I didn't see a lot of sunlight. <laughs> Not much has changed. <laughs> uh, quick question. So, because you were saying that you, you still are in contact, and, and I don't know if you're still diving with the, the people that you came up with that kind of mentored you and, and adopted you in the beginning. Have you gone back and asked them, like, man, or or – tell them like i don't know how you know after a long cave dive you could just sit with me and and run lines and run drills have you have you had a chance to have a conversation with them about that 
I have. And it started with a bit of an apology <laughs> and then a bit of gratitude. And uh, I, do, I do think of them every time I open the water, whether it's, hey, is this where I want to be right now? And you hear the voice, their voice in the back of my head. I'm like, oh, they would bring me back to life and kill me again if I got stuck here. So let's let's shape up a little bit. So still friends with most of them, I would say. A few still dive a lot and own dive shops. A few are, hey, let's go do big trips here and there. For example, we had four guys go to Bikini. One uh, dives a lot locally. The other two are a, hey, let's do a big two-week trip once a year, get a few dives preparing for that, get a few dives thereafter. That's kind of it. So I found people that are trying to dive every day or a lot of times when people make a living out of it, it leads to slightly higher burnout. So because of factors, whether it be school or education and taking time away from diving, I think it's made it possible or made me happier to just continue to be in it. Sometimes all in, sometimes it's a whole summer of every free weekends diving. And sometimes it's a, let's really focus on diving for this month. And then maybe it's a few other weekend trips. But yeah, taking a, a 14 year old to go run lines around a rock is clinically insane <laughs> oh, i mean no that's that's great training for you, <laughs> you know, like, just having that literally ingrained in you um like I'm, I'm sure it's just basically at this point second nature to you so. <laughs> um oh i still certainly make mistakes but it's the the level that i fall back to in basics at least I'm happy enough to die with pretty much everybody and not feel like a liability. Yeah, 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 no, for sure. So at this point, are you still, do you still prefer the overhead environment? And and I don't know if you're, when you're doing the, the shipwrecks in the Midwest, if, if you're actually doing any penetrations in there, but um, it, it, does one, do you like one over the other, the, the, the deep wrecks? I'm assuming they're deep being the Midwest or or just kind of deep into a cave? I don't know that I have a great answer. I think part of the motivation or part of the reason that I spend, let's call it 90% of my hours per year in a natural cave versus an artificial one is access. Some of it is happens to be what my friends are doing. Some of it is, hey, it's a Thursday. Let's go dive this weekend and fly down to Florida. And I don't have to interact with scheduling you're less likely to get weathered out. Caves kind of always there. If you have something go wrong, or uh, I think it takes some of the time pressure off. You find something, you want to go hang out in the same passage for a couple extra hours to really understand it and appreciate it. There's no pounding on a boat or a captain too upset or a ride home you have to deal with. I think it also allows generally for longer exposure times having the possibility of a storm front blowing through versus knowing that even if a hurricane came on top of you and you're in a cave, it's extraordinarily rare for the environmental condition to make it wildly unsafe. I'm sure you can have silt outs or other things. Sometimes caves reverse and you can hear anecdotes about that, but I've found more time is spent in a cave than a wreck and had or should I, let's say, own a boat in the Midwest? Maybe that's a little easier. But then you need a tender, and you need somebody to maintain the boat. So I enjoy wrecks. I think a lot of my dive trips or at least 50-50 wreck diving, whether it was Bikini Atoll or I was fortunate to go to Scapa Flow in summer of 22. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. In terms of penetrating the wrecks, I'd say it's very situationally dependent there are certain things in unintentionally sank shipwrecks that are hazards that may or may not exist in other places whereas you can go dive let's say the spiegel grove or a lot of prepared wrecks and a lot of natural hazards have been removed a lot of portholes have been knocked out versus say a war artifact in salt water and things crumble so 
I have a, I think my appreciation for a lot of non-artificial shipwrecks is in the history of them, whether it's identifying why it's there or assisting somebody who said, hey, I have this photogrammetry model, let's figure out what it is. And I really enjoy that part. But a lot of times that exposure time is limited. If you want to go have a four or five hour cave dive, very easy if you're expecting a boat to wait for you 10 miles off the coast for five or six hours or an indeterminate amount of time <laughs> you really start wanting things like owning the boat or an extra safety team it's harder to stage bottles so certainly enjoy both and fortunate to experience really both in a year-to-year basis uh, caves tend to be 90 percent of what i'm doing um and so when you First, I guess kind of, I don't want to say first got reintroduced, that, that sounds wrong, but when you went back sure. towards a rebreather, which unit did you go for? And obviously it had to do with the type of diving that you were doing, but, um, well, I guess this is going to kind of lead into my next question because um, there there is a, a big, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a lot of people agree on the fact that one should not start on a uh, side mount unit as opposed to a back mount unit. And I was hoping that you could elaborate on that a little bit on, on why one would not want to start on a, cause I, which will lead into my further down the line question, but we can get to that in a minute. <laughs> so. <laughs> sure. So I guess I'll start with what I ended up on, why I think at the time it was or wasn't a good bad, I- good or bad idea, and then progress into, at least in my opinion, kind of the why. So let's call it prior to the reacclimation, I had putzed around in a pool on an Inspo, an Evo, an Optima, and I got a Meg. And then in the reacclimation, reacclimation process had tried a classic sidekick and a sidewinder was doing a little bit of side mount diving at the time and I think in some ways I ended up getting caught up in the fad or the interest everybody that was in the local group of people that I would acknowledge would become a lot of my perpetual weekend friends whether at a quarry or a local mine were on sidekicks and sidewinders and classics. A lot of the draw to me was the ability to pack some of these units better than others into a carry-on or a backpack. I kind of detest having to check luggage and avoid it while I can. For example, (laughs) in the bikini trip, we kind of all landed in quads and we start gathering cases and checked luggage and all the divers are pretty obvious to pick out in the sense that they're either wearing dive t-shirts or covered in stickers or really they can't shut up about it. <laughs> uh, guilty. And I grab the two camera cases we had brought along, large oversized Pelican boxes, and I turn around to grab my personal check bag, which was exposure protection, fins, and harness. Uh, and I wasn't there. So out of a group of 12 of us, Five people were missing six bags, or four people were missing five bags. And fortunately, the boat at least had stashes of wetsuits, extra back plates, wings, and everyone that was on the trip was able to continue the trip. That said, I did become friends with the head of the crew, and begged, borrowed, and stole a X, uh, excuse me, not an X-Deep, a DECO, D-E-C-O, which I think is Dive Equipment Company. Uh, harness off of him and totally jerry rig a unit onto it that said the travel dominated ultimately what i was doing and in terms of traveling light or let's say i ended up combining a trip for two weeks and in the case of bikini let's call it two weeks end to end in the diving thing and i ended up flying back through japan and spent 10 days there but being able to put a single small suitcase and a carry-on in a long-term checked luggage and be totally unencumbered is really great. I think a lot of the 
distaste for starting with a side mount unit comes from two or three things. The first was that they were uncommon. So if you think the history of rebreathers, or at least the history of rebreathing the same air, predates compressed cylinder use by, I don't know, depending on who you look at or which diagrams or illustrations in patent books, quite a while. Then he started getting into more rebreather use, typically chest mounted into the early 1900s, self-contained underwater breathing or the uh, original bits of compressed gas. Let's say those are pushing into the 40s or 50s, um, at least in not having an umbilical. But when you start getting into, uh, use the word pedestrian, but commercially available rebreathers, you're getting into the 90s. And at the time, that is what existed. Things went on your back, whether it was the inspo or the classic. And anybody that wanted to start to turn away from that and go places where you couldn't necessarily fit was hacking it together at home. So whether it was, I'm going to say Billy Gambrill, I would put a lot of the credit to, at least in hearing anecdotes and becoming friends with a lot of these people, taking the original P1 Topaz, breaking it apart, putting it on his side, and then doing that for a lot of the people in the Northeast at the time. They were home-built, maybe they were finicky, and they tend to be wildly sensitive to placement of the counter lung. A little too high, a little too low, was difficult. His unit over the years evolved into having over-the-shoulder counter lungs and the scrubber head and everything else on one side so it did not experience up and down lateral movement. But at the same time, you now had counter lungs on your top. And then when you move into commercially available side mount rebreathers, the sidekick I was pretty early in that one. And in terms of being small, it was fantastic. But one of the downsides is that you lose that placement as a ability to put a bailout. So you are either compromising having one dill first stage on one side that is also your necklace to back up, and ideally your donatable gas, and the rebreather on another and it became, or it was at the time, and kind of still is a very specialized unit. The Sidewinder comes along. I think this brings us into 16, 17. The Spirit had been about for a little bit, depending on who you talk to, slightly different stories of where the idea for the Sidewinder came from. And it became unique. Uh, and in some ways, the notion of splitting a back mount unit apart, putting it on your sides, and retaining the ability to have two bailouts still is. So it fixed some of the problems associated with a, I'll call it a self-contained side mount unit or a single-sided side mount unit, but still came with some compromises. No longer was the compromise work of breathing. Maybe it was a water dump. Maybe it was difficult to put on an encounter and have it exactly horizontal. And in its popularity, there ended up being a good number of people, whether instructors or instructor trainers on the unit, that maybe didn't have enough hours or maybe had been taught in a quick manner. And uh, there was a period, and I'll say this was, I don't know, 18 to 20, and even going on a little later, where consistency and quality of instruction on those units varied quite a bit. I think in optimizing for side mount, and let's assume that you're using it in a side mount fashion or in a fashion that whether it's access to the water or access in your body position within the water, side mount is favored, there are or were still compromises. Whether it is the same water trap dilemma, the placement of the cells within the loop, and a whole bunch of other things that different people have changed or optimized around, I have found them ultimately less infallible than, say, the equivalent back mount unit. You could get into cold water performance and a whole list of other variables. I still think, and this is where the overlap 
between the open circuit side mount versus back mount and rebreather side mount versus back mount conversation I think has some parallels. I think it's more difficult as a student or as somebody that's ended up doing at least some mentoring. It's more difficult for the same diver to have the same experience in a side mount unit than a back mount unit. You can put on a let's say a JJ or a Meg and assuming the harness fits there are very few adjustments diver to diver you could be on a JJ I could borrow it the next day switch out the plates and everything would be relatively the same in units such as the Sidewinder or the Gemini uh, sometimes those things change and they change in the same way that maybe your side mount harness and my side mount harness uh, have different bungee lengths or different spine length so I think some instructors have done a better job than others in smoothing out some of those difficulties. If you look at some of the guys in Mexico, in ProTech in particular, let's say Kim or Skanda or Patrick or whoever, they've found what for them is a relatively consistent application of a side mount unit. And most of the drivers look absolutely phenomenal. But even among that instruction staff, there are little things and variables that people change from one unit to another. Whereas, say, a JJ or a Meg are largely similarly configured. So I did end up on a Sidewinder. And I think if I went back, having spent a lot of time on other units since then, it was probably not the unit I would have recommended to myself again at the time but some of that is the split of my diving that ends up being up here in cold water and off a boat or with larger scrubbers at the same time it certainly retained the ability to travel well the ability to work off a variety of platforms whether it's a rib or anything else uh, and there are definitely places I've used it where an equivalently sized back mount unit would not fit remotely. So I think as we move towards whether it's a Sidewinder 2 or the Gemini, the landscape gets a little better and a little more flat. But I do have the belief that most people, especially those with a traditional open circuit doubles background would be better suited in a back mount unit than saying ah, I've never dived side mount before let's go learn a side mount unit, unit at the same time because it's cool <laughs> it's, um, no that's definitely uh, uh, the, 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 the popular unit out there um, for various reasons and um, I, I am not a rebreather diver, so it's something that I'm looking into. And what you spoke about a little bit earlier when you were saying it, the, the big thing was the travel, because I'm very much the same way. I hate checking in luggage. Anything that I can fit, you know, in, in my carry on luggage, which usually is overweighted, but I just kind of squeak by and hopefully they don't weigh it. It's happened a couple times and then I'll spread the weight out, put some in my backpack and then just kind of, you know, spread it out. Oh, look, it's under 12 kilos now and we're good to go. But, um, and, and that was a, a huge reason for me looking at units like that because i'm starting to look at unit starting to look at rebreathers is like oh okay i need it needs to be travel friendly and it seems like a lot of units are not travel friendly and i think um i mean you, i'm sure you know firsthand the the sidewinder or gemini they're under um i want to say 12 or 13 kilos is that correct which is like 20 26 27 pounds um so you can pretty much carry them on correct Yes, yeah. I've not found myself needing to check it. So whether it's those or Choptima or some of the other chest mount units on the market, having it in carry-on, I've found to be useful, especially in times where there's not another flight later that day or the next day. Yeah, so, um, but it's one of those things because where, where I'm located in Malaysia, there's no diving around me. So anytime I want to go diving, I have to hop on a plane 
and it's usually a connecting flight. We do have a few flights where I can get somewhere direct, but either way, there's still a flight in between. So um, anytime I don't have to check in luggage, but you know, and then starting starting to to research and everything, I'm just like, okay, well, you know, maybe this is not the route I should go. Um, the 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 side mount units. So I'm looking at some back mount units now, and it's just a it's just a big research game at this point. But enough about me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, to that to that point, it can be difficult. I actually think one of the driving factors in early purchase of units, once somebody's established they want one or need one, and I think needs probably predate want in the sense that you have to be spending hours on it, but the people that you're diving with, what are they on? Because it is a commitment. It's nice to have people around you that are going through the same difficulties or can answer questions or you're going to be in the water with. Because it takes time and it takes familiarity. I think after, you could pick the number of hours, but a couple hundred hours, there are things that get easier and it's less important to be around those people. But some of that is how motivated are you to teach yourself? What parts do you have available? There are areas of the country where, say, owning an X, an XCCR from subgravity or IQ sub uh, would be more difficult. Or let's say in the Midwest, if you look around on boats, there's a couple Fathoms, there's a couple JJs, there's a slew of Classics and Optimas, simply because that's what the local instruction looks like. So if you're remote, having stuff that either needs to be serviced less frequently, or that you can afford having backup parts on hand for, or that you can replace your own cables, can be useful. Okay, yeah, and that's that's another thing that I've definitely heard is to the, the bigger of the group that has stuff then you have you know spare extra parts or knowledge because like you were just saying people going through the same thing well i guess my my next question would be i want to say it was earlier i can't remember if it was late last year or earlier i think it was earlier this year um you had made the switch from a sidewinder to a gemini and i was wondering and and there was an article put out on in-depth um, I think before that, it was actually put out on scuba board. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about that and just kind of what prompted you to make that switch? Sure. The first flitterings of the unit, I would say, came in summer of twenty two. Started hearing via the grapevine or people that I was diving with, hey, there's something else on the horizon. And a lot of times, until these rumors materialize, or you see the final thing. It's kind of a oh, this is a nice pipe dream. And I had adapted the Sidewinder to what I was using it for and happy with it and felt it was in a relatively stable spot. I hadn't changed anything on it in, I don't know, call it nine months or something. And brings us closer and closer to the end of the year. And we get to DEMA in November of 22. And Charlie Roberson starts posting images of it. And immediately the internet goes, oh my God, what is it? (laughs) Oh, it's a knockoff. Oh, it's a fathom knockoff. Oh, it's, you know, you get, it's hard to read tone on the internet and as much of a media darling as a sidewinder has been, whether social media or happening to be around great photographers or just being used a lot, it became the center of a lot of attention and questions. And... I think Michael did a very good job of cleaning up my otherwise a little too direct or perhaps a little too personal review. (laughs) I ended up early on the list figuring, well, I'm using it. Mine kind of looks like that. And let's see what happens. Whether it was supporting a couple of their instructors or saying, hey, this is actually in Florida. Uh, I'm fortunate to be friends or having spent a lot of time around Mike Young and a lot of the KISS community, but ultimately wanted to try it and felt I'd be in a reasonably good position to make a comparison. And on the upside, if it turns out I hated it, a unit with that long of a wait list probably would have been relatively easy to transition out of. So called Charlie said, hey, where are you on the list? When would I be in a position to take delivery? And the bottleneck at the time was, well, when's the instructor availability? Because the first class, I think, uh, came 
either in the month of December, so about 10 months ago, or in early January. And I think Larry uh, out of Tulum and I might have been the first or second class of people uh, kind of on their own units. So I was fortunate to find a great local buyer for mine and switch over to the Gemini. Spent that crossover kind of getting used to it in some sense it dives very similarly i think you could take any reasonably competent sidewinder diver give them a gemini a few hour introduction and they would have very little difficulty in terms of a crossover and decided hey people keep messaging me what's the difference should i change does it matter and it led to the review it took some editing to turn some dribble into something that was relatively concise and tried to remove as much bias as I could and give a what I felt to be at the time an accurate representation and even in writing that has given contact to some new friends it's been interesting watching how it was received initially uh, there's certainly people that could be in a better spot to draw a comparison in terms of there are people that teach both units I don't know that there are there certainly were not at the time, as far as I know, anybody with more Sidewinder hours that was also diving at Gemini. So in terms of having a one of the first 10 units, I felt it wouldn't hurt, and very least if it helped one person say, oh, this makes sense, I want to wait, I want to try this, I want to get on the waiting list, then I'd be happy with that. I also think that the having a product in your hand versus something that seems like a lot of great research is being done into, but with no tentative ship date. Uh, some of it was a speculative, everyone's going to start selling Sidewinders in hopes of upgrading to the next one. So in decay, or the potential loss of value, the longer I waited, I think it made sense for me to switch to the Gemini. And I think pretty much everything I wrote in the article has remained true in terms of what I like, what I don't like, and there are more and more pictures and things coming out about the Sidewinder 2. We'll kind of see, depending on price point, if I end up interacting with it at all. But for me, it's... I still think or believe, like, the N equals 1 if you only own one unit. I've been pretty happy with it. So, some of... So, from from what I remember reading in the article, um, it you were saying that you took the Sidewinder and did a lot of modifications. Were these modifications done on the Gemini, like out of the factory? Is so is that is that was that kind of another driving force towards you going towards the Gemini? I think so. My modified Sidewinder, uh, I converted it back to stock to sell it, but when I was diving it quite a bit and the Gemini were very similar. I think in terms of things that the Sidewinder 1 did not have that the Gemini did. One was an integrated HUD. I've ended up a strong proponent of dual monitoring. It had switched cell types. There are seemingly endless debates on Molex, which is a specific connector type versus a SMB connector type. And whether it was belief in a bailout valve and finding a way to adopt a bailout valve onto a sidewinder, moving over to a needle valve with a non-compensated first stage for the stronger IP. I don't know that I gained safety, necessarily, because from a functional standpoint, both units were my modified sidewinder and the stock Gemini were very similar. So while it looked cleaner, and not having a battery box for a HUD on my loop, and instead being integrated into the Gemini head, all worked out pretty well. Yeah, no, I've so I've I've had a, a couple a, a, at, at this point a couple of conversations with Charlie, super super nice guy, and um, no, he definitely seems like he's doing well with uh, Fathom and and not just the Gemini, but the I, I can't remember what the back mount unit is um but no they seem like they're so are you a bigger fan of mechanical as opposed to electronic Ooh, that's a hard one <laughs> i i think and maybe this is up for debate because they've coexisted for about 20 years or so 
over time we'll see more and more of a trend towards electronic units. That said, I'm not super sure. I think dived well, pretty much identical and interchangeable, and people with experience on both have no problem switching back and forth. I think failure modes can be kind of different in the sense that a stuck solenoid and a stuck needle valve have different solves, different ways to fix it. I think generally I've leaned away from significant numbers of batteries as far as I can, but at the same time you try and remove all the batteries at some point, you're only diving in daylight and uh, using a J valve. So I have found, and again this is anecdotal, depending on where you are in your rebreather career, there are some personalities or some attention spans or sets of situational awareness that would be better served by an ECCR than an MCCR. To an equivalently diligent person, I don't think it matters. But if you are either not somebody that is paying as great attention or somebody that often does not have the ability to respond to multiple signals at once, like humans are wildly bad at multitasking to begin with, then an ECCR provides a notable safety mechanism in the sense it is actively trying to sustain life. Are solutions to problems different and sometimes solutions to problems more complicated? Certainly. So I don't mind diving either. I think I, at this point, prefer MCCRs, but if somebody said, hey, we need to be on a liberty for this, this, and this reason, I'd have no problem with that. My next question, and this is where my, my ignorance is going to come into play, so I apologize, because um, I don't know if both units have it, but I, I know when I was looking online, there was a lot of, and I don't know if all units have this, so I apologize if I'm, I'm saying the wrong sure. thing here, um, but... I know that there was, I, I saw a lot of arguments with the O2 shutoff valve. Is that correct? Yes. That has uh, often been a point of contention in okay. the aftermath of a death or two over the past couple of years. So I'm assuming that the Fathom does not, or I'm sorry, the Gemini does not have that, but that was like, can, can you speak a little bit on what the argument is there? Sure. Uh, or at least I can give it from my perspective. I do not know of a unit, I say this, no, I, th I can think of, mm, I can think of zero, uh, of a unit that comes with a inline sliding oxygen shutoff as stock. So if we go back, let's say years and years ago to a certain Revo instructor in South Florida, he felt that it was necessary to put on a sliding shutoff on all of his bailouts. So in the sense that you pressurize your bailout cylinder, you close the shutoff, and no matter if you hit the purge button or you're scootering or anything else, the line remains pressurized. The shutoff in rebreather use, or at least on the unit, I think, uh, all goes back to the ADV, or the automatic diluent valve. So you're breathing effectively in and out of a Ziploc bag if the depth of the bag or the amount of gas remaining in the bag is low enough. You, to oversimplify, suck through a straw and a demand valve adds additional gas into the loop. And that gas is diluent, allows you to flush the loop from whatever's in it down to whatever is in and plugged in as your diluent. A in a manual CCR, and let's simplify it to those that have a constant flow, uh, there's three, those that have no flow, those that have a constant mass flow or a CMF or an orifice and a needle valve. The We'll skip the first one as it never really made a whole lot of headway. I think maybe it was Andrew Georgitis uh, on the classic or whatever unit it was at the time, had a unit that did not have any automatic passive way of oxygen being added to the loop. And scrub that away. So we end up with either a constant mass flow or a needle valve. And 
in terms of on or off, the only way with a constant mass flow orifice to stop the flow of oxygen would be either to turn off the regulator at its source, so at the cylinder valve, or to add something closer to, let's say, the center of mass to be able to stop that flow. So on an MCCR, let's say you open the valve, you verify the unit's working, and you neglect to close that valve. The unit will continue to flow oxygen into the loop at a rate wherever the orifice and the IP of the fixed regulator are set indefinitely or until the tank is empty. On most units, there's an overpressure valve, so that as that Ziploc bag's bag expands and continues to have oxygen being added to it, it escapes and vents off. A needle valve is similar, but you can close down the valve such that it flows oxygen at a less fast rate. I believe a lot of the early use in oxygen shutoff valves, at least in the context of a sidewinder, came from either people that found themselves testing the unit, saying, oh, unit's working, I'm going to leave my oxygen valve on, I can't screw that up when I get in the water, and adding a slider, or such that the valve was mounted in a place where they were unable to reach it easily. So there were a few instructors in different places that would install a shutoff in line in the sense that, hey, you don't have to reach back and turn your valve off. You can simply install the slider in line and going from having oxygen being passively added to the loop to not is the shut of a switch. I think they ended up being adopted in a widespread fashion because of that. The difficulty or one of the motivations behind their existence in the first place was that the individual teaching it was switching from that rebreather to a redundant rebreather or a second breather in the course of the same dive. So in that sense, keeping the regulator pressurized but not flowing oxygen was a benefit. There are people that will say, oh, well, if you can't reach the cylinder valve, just add a slider. And really, I think everybody should be able to reach their cylinder valve. Otherwise, you probably shouldn't be diving with the unit in the water. I have used one with, used one without. I ended up eventually having no slider and only a needle valve on whether it was the Sidewinder before I sold it or the Gemini now and became less of a fan. I think the argument can get really nuanced and it's been the source of heavy debate even amongst well-renowned Sidewinder divers. There was a case in the back of Jenny Springs in the past couple years where the outcome seems to suggest that at one point in going through a restriction, a slider was moved from open to closed, and thus oxygen stopped flowing. And in the aftermath, uh, it would seem a couple of the members of Dive Talk ended up with a video with Ed in saying, well, if you even if you shut off the slider and you're at the minimum functional amount of gas in the loop, you can't have problems. At the end of the day, there aren't really many surprise resolutions or new learnings in dive deaths these days. But I don't know of any unit that comes with a slider stock and in my, and I'll call it user level, certainly rather than instructor level, I don't think they're necessary. And what kills you ultimately will be not knowing your PO2. So whether the slider does or doesn't lead to that is probably a source of different debate. Okay, well, no, thank you very much. I appreciate you going into that because, um, like I said, it's still a lot of this stuff is still new to me, so I'm just trying to slowly take in the information so that definitely clears things up a little bit um so at the end of the day not a fan <laughs> not a fan no i uh i'd ban them if i could and that's even with having spent time under the tutelage of people that do believe in them i think minimizing decision making at least in that context is probably a good thing and i think that their use of them on a frequent basis should uh, imply they're being used incorrectly outside of, say, a bailout breather 
consequence. So I'm of the, you open your oxygen valve as you're getting in the water and you don't close it until your dive day is done. It makes it easier when I'd say on average, it's rare that I'm doing more than one rebreather dive in a day. So it's very easy to say, hey, that my valve is open. You tell your team as you get in the water and that is it. Communicating that underwater, uh, I think can lead not necessarily to negligence because ultimately you're still piloting the rebreather and making your own decisions and comments, but mitigating the number of things that can interrupt myself from screwing the unit up or preventing the unit from operating as intended. Certainly down to modify units, but I have not found a slider to be a huge value add for me. Man, I still have a bunch more questions, but we're kind of hitting that that hour mark, so I'm debating whether to ask another question or, or just kind of call oh, it. Oh, you're going to have to invite me back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might have to. I might have to for sure. Um, well, on, on that note, yeah, because I, 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 I definitely would love to pick your brain more on on your your obviously vast knowledge of rebreathers and just diving in general. Um, but I'll, I'll end the – we'll end on this question. I usually end kind of on the same question. Um, somebody that is looking to get into overhead environments – Let's say, I mean, obviously, a lot of us can't start off at 14 just running line drills. Uh, <laughs> but oh, I wish uh, I wish everybody was in such a fortunate spot. That's for sure. <laughs> um, what piece of advice would you give to somebody that is just starting their journey into overhead environments? You know, do's, do nots. Um, because usually, usually I would say they're a little bit older at that point. Um, and, and even for me, too, because I'm, I'm hoping to kind of start that journey next year. And I've done a little bit of overhead, but definitely there's, there's a very long way to go. So, I think a few things come to mind. The first is discerning why you're looking for it. Is it a type A, wow, this can be done in a very finessed manner? I can demonstrate competence. Is it a way to go see something different, something that's less commonly seen? But then I think the first question in starting the career path is where are you hoping to dive? And how often are you going to have access to that environment? Going and let's say for you, there's quite a bit of instruction instruction available in let's say Thailand. And that's probably one of the places you are most likely to go experience cave diving. If you're saying, oh, I'm going to cave dive in Thailand all the time. Let's go to Playa in Mexico. Let's go get trained there. Sure, you can have incredibly great training, but some of the value in the training and establishing friendships is having other people to dive with. So I think trying to understand where your diving is going to take you or what you're hoping to do can be really important and then I think a bit of humility is important finding an instructor that you can jive with I think is perhaps as important as anything else I've come across friends that have had instructors that said ah cave diving is not for me and a couple of years later via a friend or a significant other went to try it again and they're like wow this is just totally a different experience there's some people that work well with militaristic style training there's some people that want to make mistakes i think there's a ton of value and i talk about this whether it's in diving and the people i've been fortunate to mentor or in a workplace or let's say i do a lot of rock climbing but i think it's important to be able to experience mistakes for yourself but in a way that it is safe so in let's say a startup context everyone loves to talk about failing fast i think the term's a little overblown but the intent behind it's all right i think when it becomes when you move into the vein or the sphere of say risks with a high potential exposure uh, it's important to fail safely and make those mistakes if you're belaying somebody poorly, it's important to have the owner of the gym or the old trat dad next to you freak out and say, what are you doing? Stop. So I think there's a lot of value in making small mistakes in the course of a class and being willing to talk about that. 
there's a lot of talk over the past few years of having a, a just culture or a culture of safety where you can talk about those things. My A lot of my learning has come from post-dive debriefs. Hey, we just did this dive. We're both on the surface. We're not bent. We're not tired. We have no injuries. Sweet. Let's just hang out for 20 minutes and walk through it again. Because even at high levels and people doing these big dives, some little thing is probably going to go wrong. And I think if you're willing to talk about it, whether it's a few minutes after the dive or a day later is really important otherwise you're just not going to make progress and when you promote those conversations because it's hard sometimes hey i screwed up hey the bottle was staged in the wrong spot hey i know it was my hose wasn't tucked whatever those things happen to be when you talk about it i think it shows both a willingness to learn and it's easier to find people to dive with because mistakes happen you know there's in the course of let's say even what I would describe a benign two-hour cave dive in Mexico on a well-traveled line in a huge amount of space. There are a lot of decisions that are made between the time you gear up and the time you're back in the truck. And talking about them and being open and honest with your partners is great. Because at some point you're going to be more experienced, at other points you're going to be less experienced. And having that, I've found, at very least, you get invited back and at best you get invited back make some friends and you learn something because especially every place you travel is going to have a slightly different perspective or nuance and it's really nice to walk into a shop halfway up across the world and either know somebody via referral or you know the guy behind the counter and they're stoked to see you again <laughs> words of wisdom right there i love it well grant i Really, really appreciate you coming on to the podcast today. It's been super insightful. And um, definitely I will, I would love to have you back on, love to invite you back on. And and um, I don't know if you've been, if you've had a chance to listen to some of the episodes, but I've been uh, getting these round table sessions going on. And um, I actually just had Charlie on one not too long ago. And um, I, I think it would be great to have you on a round table to kind of add your perspective to a different group. Um, not a different group, sorry, within a group, I should say. Um, or even just back on as a, a solo interview because I definitely have lots more questions and it would be great to have you back on. Cool. Well, I appreciate you working so diligently to get a hold of me. I didn't know I, uh, I know I didn't make it easy for you, but I look forward to being back. Off-gassing, a scuba podcast.